Is this frequency open? Is this frequency open? CQ, 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 WX0, MIK, Whiskey X-Ray 0, Mike India Kilo. CQ, 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 WX0, MIK. Hello and welcome to the next edition of the Michaels Podcast. This is the Dog Days of Podcasting edition for August 29th, 2019. I am your host, Mike Wills, otherwise known as WX0MIK. That's my my ham radio call sign. And uh, this season of Dog Days Podcast, we are going through the um, ARRL ham radio license manual for the technicians. And uh, just cut and covering the highlights so when you get into it, you kind of have at least a little bit of background. At least a little bit I can produce or give based on me having my license for three months now. So we are up to chapter 9.4 and there are two chapters left. We are getting real close to the end. Perfect timing. So um, RF exposure, chapter 9.4. Um, In recent years, there have been a lot of discussion about whether there are health and safety hazards from exposure to electromagnetic radiation, or EMR. Uh, Many studies have been done, both power line frequencies and RF, both shortwave and mobile phone frequencies. No link has been established between exposure to low-level EMR, electromagnetic radiation, and health risks, including those frequencies used by amateurs. RF radiation is not the same as ionizing radiation from radioactivity because energy in radio signals is too f- far too low to cause an electron to leave an atom or ionize. Therefore, uh, cannot cause genetic damage. With its relatively low frequency, RF energy is non-ionizing radiation. However, and I'm going to start summarizing because I've been reading straight from the book, <laughs> Um, however, high levels of RF can still cause heating of the body. Think of your microwave. Your microwave is doing electromagnetic radiation, and it is cooking your meat. Your body can do the same. So the FCC has set regulations on the limits of maximum ex- permissible exposure from radio transmitters of every, any sort. To abide by these rules without requiring expensive testing, hams are expected to evaluate their stations, see if, they're operating, if their operation has potential to exceed the MPE levels or that maximum permissible exposure. Uh, the evaluation process is covered later in the section. Um, you can, there's also other ways. To, they also cover several other ways to do it. Uh, there's even a calculator online somewhere, I don't remember exactly where that is, that can help you calculate that. So basically what you're doing is you're saying, okay, I want to run my um, antenna, I have a 100 watt station, and so my effective wattage that being transmitted is, let's just say 50, because... But when you're talking on voice, you're not talking all the time. It's not like a radio station where you're always broadcasting. You're just talking. So you you assume 50% of the time, so that um, cuts your 100-watt output to 50. And then you're not usually working at the highest possible and so on and so on. That all feeds into a a calculation. And then, boom, here's your um, your, uh max distance away. So the total amount of heating then depends on both the RF field intensity and frequency and is called the specific absorption rate or SAR. Um, RF burns can be eliminated by proper bonding techniques or by preventing access to an antenna. Don't uh, set up an antenna broadcasting out at 1500 watts and let your two-year-old touch it. It's going to be hot. And probably not safe to be that close to it anyway. Uh, the intensity of the RF field is called power density. 
in the amount of energy per unit of area. Um, and then there's they talk about the formulas there, some exposure limits. Let's get into the, the good stuff here. So um, they ask what the following frequencies are the lowest value for maximum permissible exposure limit. That's kind of one of the questions. And um, they, as it go through here, they kind of describe uh, what it is and then what it can absorb. So if we dive into the table right next to it, they have two different things, controlled exposure and uncontrolled exposure. So these are two sets of numbers you have to deal with. So controlled exposure is you and your ham shack, and you know that by broadcasting, you're, you're giving yourself X amount of, of uh, exposure, and it's assumed that you'll manage that appropriately. Uncontrolled exposure, you're pointing an antenna right past your neighbor's house and cooking them, <laughs> so to speak, or literally maybe. In frequency ranges, so from uh, 0 0.03 to z 3 megahertz, power density is 100 plane wave equivalent, I'm not even sure, oh, milliwatts per centimeter squared. So you have all these different formulas. <laughs> um, that's why I said this website that there was, I can't, I don't know what it was called or even how to find it right now. Um, basically what that did is you say, okay, I'm broadcasting at this frequency, which you can kind of assume within the range of like 80 meter, two meter, so on. So then you can say, okay, I'm broadcasting at this. I'm outputting this many watts. How far can a person be within a controlled exposure and an uncontrolled exposure in order to ensure safety? You then make sure that you honor that. Um, so one thing they mention, I believe it's within, yeah. So they got, they, uh, one thing they mention in here is, okay, so you're using a beam antenna slash Yagi, whatever you want to call it. If you know that technically your neighbor is too close um, to where they could have uncontrolled RF exposure, you might want to just not point it towards your neighbor's house just to ensure that you don't have any problems. So think, there's ways to, to control it. Um, but okay, so the definition of controlled versus uncontrolled. People in controlled environments are aware of their exposure and can take necessary steps to minimize it. People in uncontrolled environments are not aware of their exposure, such as areas open to the general public or your neighbor's property. So that's the definition there. Um, averaging and duty cycles. So this is where I started to talk about the duty cycle a little bit. So since the effects from RF exposure are related to heating and take place over many seconds, the MPE limits are based on averages, not peak exposure. So you can be outputting 1,500 watts for five seconds, but you're not going to, that's not an issue. But if you're doing it for six minutes, which is averaging period is six minutes for controlled environments, that could be a problem. And then 30 minutes for uncontrolled environments. You know, if you're talking about passing by car, they're not going to be necessarily affected but if you're looking at a high school that could be a whole different thing or some office building whatever um, the difference in averaging periods reflects the difference in how long people are expected to be present and exposed is really what the um, uncontrolled environment is about um, for most amateur contacts the transmitter output is no more than 50% of the time and usually much less this pattern lowers the duty cycle of the emissions. Duty cycle is the ratio of the transmitted signals on, on the air time to the total operating time during the measurement of the period. Um, so if, on the next page, they have a table to help um, evaluate exposure. So on the next, on um, one of the next pages, they talk, they talk about your operating duty cycle of your most commonly used modes. So single sideband conversation is going to be somewhere between 20 and 40% duty cycle. Um, your, uh, voy 
AM they're putting it at about um, 50% with a 50 or 50, yeah, 50%. Um, F, FM voice is 100% duty cycle. Um, again, that's a, these are just some estimated numbers. And so you use that as part of the formula to calculate out what is this average. So according to FCC, all fixed stations must perform a, an exposure evaluation. Mobile and handheld trans transceivers are exempt, um, typically because either A, it's so low, it doesn't matter. My 5-watt my five handhelds put out 5, five watts or technically probably less. They should be held 9 inches away from your body, um, I believe is what it was, 6 to 9 inches, something like that to really be safe. Um, your cell phone was like four inches, if I remember right, based on estimated calculations that I read one time. And that's based on really your eyes <laughs> more than anything else, if I remember right. Some interesting trivia for down the road. So before you start, check to see if your station is exempt from evaluation requirement. If the transmitter power PEP or using PEP to the antenna is less than the level shown at which you operate. Then no evaluation is required. Okay, so that's what this table is. So if you are working a two meter uh, stage, two meter station, and you're running at fifty watts, you don't need to do an evaluation. Uh, however, if you're running a hundred watts, now you got to do that evaluation. Um, if you start dropping down to, and man, I did not realize this when I <laughs> read this the first time. Uh, so let's, um, let's just, uh, most hams are on 40 to 80 meters at night. So you can crank out up to 500 watts of power before you, the FCC requires you to do an uh, exposure um, test. So that's a lot of power. Most of your your radios only put out a hundred without using an amplifier. So, but I would still do the math and the calculation on that because do you want to expose yourself or your family to that? You might not. It just to be safe. Um. So what if you find a potential hazard? Uh, locate antennas away from where people can get close to them and away from property lines. This is always a good idea since such an en antenna energized even with low power signals can result in RF burn. Make the antenna higher. You know, that adds more height, that adds more distance. Um, if you have a beam antenna, avoid pointing it towards where people are likely to be or your neighbors. Uh, use a lower gain antenna to produce uh, radiated power density. So, you know, the DBI, it's all about the DBI's baby. Well, drop that down. Uh, limit the average power of your transmissions by transmitting short, shorter periods. So don't talk so much. <laughs> or more so use less digital modes because that's really where deals are typically at 100% duty cycle. Um, plates and antennas on the... So even though emissions from mobile and handhelds are exempt, there's some good ways to minimize unnecessary RF exposure. Place mobile antennas on the roof or trunk of the car to maximize shielding to the passengers. Always use a remote uh, microphone to hold the handheld transceiver away from your head while transmitting and things like that. Um, they do go into the formula here, finally. So the average power is your PEP times the operating duty cycle times, and then parentheses, time transmitting divided by average period. Um, so, for example, let's say your 100-watt transmitter is generating conversational single sideband without speech processing. Um, table 9.5 shows an, an operating duty cycle of 20% for that mode. During your operating period, you transmit for one minute out of every three. Your average power during this period is 100 watts times 20% for conversational SSB 
times 1 minute divided by 3 minutes, or 0.33, is equal to 6.6 .6 watts. During a 2 meter net as net control, your 50 watt VHF FM transmitter, you can transmit and listen for equal periods. Your average power is actually about 25 watts if you go through the same formula. <clears throat> so then the effect of antenna gain is another another item that you plug into there. For example, if your antenna is a 6 dBi of gain corresponding to a fourfold increase in power radiated to the preferred direction. So now you multiply that out by 4. So the general procedure for figuring this out is start with the average power for each transmitter on each band and use the same process discussed above, starting with full PEP and then applying various corrections for mode and patterns of use. If you have long coaxial feed lines, you'll want to subtract uh, feed line losses, particularly in the 30 to 1500 megahertz frequency range because that takes away power. Uh, then use the ARRL tables to include the effects of antenna gain and height. Finally, use the tables to determine the distance required from the antenna to comply to MPE limits. It's a lot of work. Um, like I said, there is some people who've created uh, calculators for you. So all you have to plug in is say, I am on... Um, I'm using this frequency, and I think the one I'm thinking of says this is my effective power. So you're supposed to do the math of, okay, I'm on a 6 dBi increase antenna, but my loss on the line is going to be 3 dB, so it's really 3 dB increase, which is, what, 10 times more power. I don't remember. Not twice as powerful. I don't remember. Off the top of my head, it's late. Um, and then, um, and then you say, okay, I'm mostly single sidebands or phone. So ultimately, and you assume worst case scenario of saying, well, I'm going to be running at 100 watts. So now you just plug that on into um, figuring out approximately what your wattage should be at the point of the antenna. And then you plug that into the um, formula in order to determine what your overall exposure is. Um, it works. It works pretty decent. Um, and I think as long as you show that you have done it, that's all they care about. You know, They're not expecting you to go buy expensive test equipment to actually physically test it. I think that would be... I, don't, I haven't heard of anyone talking about doing that. So when I was looking for a location put up antennas, and I obviously haven't put anything up yet, but um, I was looking for places that were away from where people sleep just so it's there's less chance of exposure. Where I, where I would be sitting as composed of the antenna, I would be physically the closest person under normal circumstances if I'm doing this stuff kind of stuff at night. So that is what I was think also think about as I think about antenna placement. Um, that's why I don't do roof or attic or anything like that because I want to just make sure it's out of the picture. So I am. This is a extra long one, but I wanted to. This is also probably one of the most important sections because whether you hate your neighbors or not, you probably. Uh, you probably don't want to cook them. And this is really what it's about, is not cooking the neighbor, not cooking the office building next to you, um, not cooking your own family. It's about keeping everyone safe. You know, and even so far as you might need to put a small fence around your your main antenna or some part of it, because, again, if they touch it, they could get burnt. And you don't want that. So other things you kind of want to think about as you are planning and making. Well, I don't think ultimately it's overly critical. It's something to think about. Um, when I was at um, a field day, a guy showed up. He, I, I, what was it? A random wire or infant antenna? Or, I think it was infant antenna. 
uh, linked to a, a tuner. So we just kind of strung it up, tied it to the bleachers, and uh, ran the ground off into the into the grass, and that was it. There was no like calculation. Of, okay, we have to be twenty feet away here because of this, and we got to make sure we gate this off so no one walks around it. People were walking underneath it while he's transmitting and everything. So that's when I kind of got the first realization. It's like, okay, this might be important, but it's not that important. You know, obviously, if you're doing higher power, it becomes a little more critical. But if all you're, as long as you're consciously not putting it directly over where your kids are sleeping every night and cranking out 1500 watts, you probably are going to be fine. Um, just something, the extra thing to think about as you do this kind of stuff. And I haven't done it yet with my stuff, but I also have very low loss uh, feed line at the moment. So, and honestly, the closest person would be us to the, where I'm putting up my uh, VHF antenna. So I'm a little less worried about it because I'm going to try and keep it somewhat away from everyone. And you, when you get in the VHF, the distance is, that you need to stay away is much less than HF. Uh, one of the videos I watched, he did a demonstration, said full power, doing CW or digital, one of those modes. It was like a thousand feet away. You had to stay from pe- stay away from people. If you're cranking out that much power, you better know what you're doing because you also have to buy a thousand, two thousand dollar amplifier or something like that to do it. So, yeah, you're, I, I hope you know what you're doing if you're doing that. And I've said that about 30 times now. So, I'm going to wrap this up before I keep repeating myself. And uh, thank everybody for listening. Uh, this has been an enjoyable Dog Days of Podcasting two days left I believe it is and uh, so I will be finishing up with mechanical safety which should be common or good sense common sense whatever you want to call it but it needs to be said so we'll follow up with the book on that tomorrow and then uh, we'll do some sort of a wrap up with whatever days are left so until then um, this is WX0 MIK And I don't think I'm cooking my neighbors tonight, but the frequency is clear, so I don't have to worry about it anymore. The frequency is clear. WX0MIK73.